Hello, friends. This is the second interview that I conducted with Jim Ward. This is from January of 2021, and this would have been uh, not terribly long after his July of 2020 appearance on the show. Uh, Jim was always a great interview and it was fun having him on the show. Um, he was very generous with his time. This was fairly early on when I started doing streaming and, and video recording and, uh, things like StreamYard weren't exactly on my radar. So you'll have to pardon the not great video quality. Uh, I will say just listen because, uh, Jim was a great storyteller, and I hope you'll enjoy the time that I get to spend with him. And uh, if you like the video, please do give it a thumbs up. Thank you for watching. Burn itself out over the summer, and you know we'll be ready to roll. I I can imagine, but you know for for the better. Yep. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, folks, welcome, welcome, one and all. We are here today with the one and only Jim Ward. At least he's the uh, only one that I'm aware of. And he's definitely the only one who is a TSR and RPG industry veteran, uh, a writer, a creator, uh, one of the founders of Dungeons and Dragons, um, and all around swell guy. So everybody, Jim Ward, Jim, this is everybody. Oh dear. Okay. Let's see. Is um, I can still see me on camera. My camera appears to be still working. Uh, let, I can see you. I can see you. We can see you. Uh, can everybody hear Jim okay? I just want to make sure that we've got Jim's audio. Um, Eric says, should we judge him for wearing Green Bay colors? I'm not, I'm not going to touch that one. I'm not, I'm not going to touch that one. <laughs> hey. uh, uh, let me let me see let me let me make sure I'm uh I'm I'm seeing seeing both of us over here Now you can see me. Okay, let me make sure. Sure thing, sure thing. Um, and I'm just going to double check uh, my settings on this end that we can uh, the, that we can hear you okay. Um, let's see, desktop audio. Uh, add. I know, right? I mean, you know, we were, uh, let's see. Okay, how about that? All right. Uh, we'll get this right here, folks. I promise. That's good. Do you know how many people you have listening right now? Uh, I usually get a good eight or ten folks uh, on the stream. It kind of goes up and down a little bit, but uh, I do uh, I do get a for uh, for special awesome guests like you. I, I'll, I'll, yeah. I'll get a good I'll get a good stack of viewers of the stream later. Okay, everybody, uh, can can everyone hear Jim now? Jim, give us a mic check. 
Hello, everybody. Here I am, ready to answer every single question in the world. All right. Okay. Yes, that is uh, that is a check. So, um, once again, uh, welcome to the the great Jim Jim Ward. Um, now, for those of you who didn't catch Jim back uh, this summer, um, I'm just going to jump straight in with some funny anecdotes and uh, the, that uh, Jim related and let him punch those up if he likes. Um, okay. It, any of you that have a Supplement 1 Greyhawk uh, for original D&D, um, Jim is immortalized in the spell Meteor Swarm <laughs> uh, because he and Rob... Uh, got into it over was meteor swarm the fireball spell or was it fire balls uh and not no, no, only... <laughs> it, was, it was actually no it was actually is it fireballs or is it meteors that was the big okay, uh, see that that's that's why i gotta have you here to, to there, we go, yeah, there so, we go yeah so so uh they they both went to gary and not only did gary lay down the law to them he laid it down to Jim. It is immortalized forever I know. in the original D&D &D rules. <laughs> so <laughs> wrong. So very wrong. <laughs> but that's okay because, because he, he did you, he did you a, a boon by giving you the total healing mutation for the uh, world and then later, or for uh, uh, Metamorphosis Alpha. Yeah, there we go. Yeah, yeah. but I, I didn't let him have it for years and years. <laughs> Actually, it didn't even happen until after he died, really. Yeah, I have a friend who got that awesome uh, uh, Kickstarter set of Metamorphosis Alpha, and he was letting me leaf through that. And I, I read your story about total healing, total healing, and that just warmed my heart. Yeah, really? Total I can, healing. Well, should I expand on that for just a quick second? I would love it if you did, and I bet All right, so, else would too. So, Gary loved playing Metamorphosis Alpha because he never got to play as a player. He always had to do, be the DM that taught the game to people at conventions and uh, and everywhere else. And so when I would come down to uh, Lake Geneva, um, he he got to play uh, being a player, and he and he loved it. He liked Metamorphosis Alpha a lot. Um, but after the, after the first time playing, and oh, I'm beeping. Just a second. Okay. I wanted to make sure I wasn't late for our uh, appointment, so I set a time. So, at, um, so after our very first time playing, when he got um, brought down to one hit point, he said, "Jim, you need total healing as a mutation." And I said, "No, Gary, I think that's way too strong." And and he said, "No, Jim, you're you're wrong. You have total healing as a mutation." And I said, "No, I don't, Gary. It's not in the book." And he had written in pencil the mutation total healing and what it did and how many times he could use it. And he says, it's in my book, so I guess I get to use it. Well, you know, what? try arguing with E. Gary Gygax. It just, just doesn't work. So uh, edition after edition, he would write in in pencil total healing and what it did and how many times he got to use it expecting me to let him have it and i never did but finally uh, we did a big book of mutations after he passed away and i put in total healing just for him so up there he's smiling that he finally got his total healing mutation that's great man that is i'm i'm assuming he's up there as opposed to down there i yeah <laughs> i i i i definitely concur i'd like to uh I'd, I'd I'd like to think he is. So there we go. So speaking of gaming and people getting to play, Jim, are you uh -huh. running? Are are you are you going to be running some virtual games at GaryCon? I'm going to be doing three: um, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. Great. Um, Friday is a special game. I run I run a game every Friday afternoon now mm -hmm. at uh, at two thirty um, Wisconsin time. For a bunch of novelists, um, writers that are, are in California and, and on the East Coast as well, we we call it Crimson Hawk, okay. and it's it's A D and D, and they're all like seventh level right now, nice. and 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 they're kicking my dungeons butt, which is kind of irritating. But I do that every week, so that's a lot of fun, um, and and we're gonna have Luke has the special guest, and we're gonna stream it on. 
Uh, streaming on something. Streaming. On Twitch? On, is it, thank you very much. You're, streaming you're, on Twitch. Exactly right. Um, I don't do Twitch, but the people who are in the game do. Sure. And then Saturday, I'm going to do uh, on the Metamorphosis Alpha, and Sunday, I'll probably do a Gamma World. Excellent. Excellent, man. Um, I will... You sparked such a, a, a an interest uh, with me for Gamma World, for getting for for finally at long last taking a look at Gamma World that uh, I did uh, I did pick it up. I got it print on demand, so I've got a nice printed copy uh, this summer, and I liked it so much. I will be running a Gamma World game on Thursday. Oh, nice, Gary Khan. So yes, cool. I, I am taking the plot of well, I don't want to give that away i wouldn't want that's good which this. version are you running are there other versions than the first version there there are seven versions now <laughs> of course i'm running the first version man okay very good how very wise of you yes i, I run the first or second version myself um it, it's kind of become the ugly stepchild i don't own it anymore hasbro owns it mm. and uh and I, I don't really like what they've done with the later versions but I don't mind running the first and second one. Yeah, and it's a shame because the later versions kind of uh, wrecked um, my interest uh, for a little bit in the 90s. Yeah, so, yeah, sure. You know, of course, for, for those who might not uh, might not be familiar with, with uh, uh, Gamma World, um, there's... There, there's absolutely a degree of gonzo to it, <laughs> but it leans much more heavily towards, uh, I would say, a cannibal for Leibowitz or sauce the rope or something like that than it does uh, towards uh, the comic books. The yeah, Commandy. the, the uh, commandies. Uh, yeah, exactly, stuff like that. Uh, but. I mean, all 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 that went out the window, with with later editions, um, you know. And I I I get it. We we don't have to be grim dark all the time. I mean, I'm running a Twilight 2000 game on on uh, Sunday, which is the the exact opposite of the vibe of one e Gamma World when it comes to post apocalypse games. Uh -huh. But. At the same time, you know, it, it, it doesn't it doesn't have to be like a, a circus mad magazine kind of game and still be um, still be Gamble World. Sure. So. Um, so, yeah. Yeah. You know, uh, when I when I got my print on demand copy, I was I was so happy and I was like, I can't believe I missed this all these years. <laughs> oh, all well, there you go. Goodness. And it interface you even wrote in the rules. This game is designed to be compatible with advanced Dungeons and Dragons. And I love that. Yeah. Yeah. You know, just just the the chance that, uh, you know, you hit you, you hit a uh, you hit a sphere of annihilation with a wand of negation and. Your party could find themselves in the ruins of post-apocalypse Los Angeles. It is it is a fun scenario to send the the D and D people to Gam World or or send Gam World people to D and D. Mm -hmm. it, it's just fun to do that. It's it's very unexpected. At first, they just they're they're, they're all terrified at first, <laughs> but when they realize that that all magic works all the time and all mutations work all the time. They, they get they get calmed down a little bit and they start having fun oh yeah oh yeah i i had actually planned uh this is years and years ago and unfortunately you know the best laid plans of dms and and men uh often gang a glide but i had a player lose uh their character to the void on a bad draw on the deck of many things oh wow and so my thought was that his uh soul if you will would be inside a supercomputer in an abandoned base in uh in gamma world oh that's fun and that eventually the party might travel there and you know borrowing a little bit from spock's brain reunite uh, body and soul but uh, it didn't work out that way uh-huh 
Well, you know, that's, I, I do own Metamorphosis Alpha, which is, which is, I call it D and D in outer space or D and D in a can, mm -hmm. and uh, and so there, there's a ton of mutations and fun things going on there. Um, just last year, the a group was be able to put the ship back on course. So I kind of in the back of my mind, I'm thinking about doing a Metamorphosis Alpha planet. Oh, that's neat. That's well, I neat. hope so. We'll see if I ever get it done. But uh, I, I got the idea kind of, and I, I know what I want to do. I just have to find the time to write it. Well, I, 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 cer I certainly hope uh, we get to see that. We have a question here from uh, Chris Spiller. Always wish TSR published a GW ad and crossover module. Did anyone ever think of doing that to get the customers exposed to new systems? <laughs> Yeah, they thought about doing it all the time, but they just we never did it. We just we just either did Gam World modules or AT and D modules. We didn't mm -hmm. we didn't cross over too much. I mean, we should have done a Boot Hill crossover for sure. We should have done a couple crossovers for sure, but they just we we did a ton of product, um, you know, at TSR, and we just weren't able to get that done. Yeah, that that both of those would have been nice. I. It, like I said, when I was a kid and getting into AD and D, I was unfamiliar with Boot Hill. It was, it was totally unfamiliar with Boot Hill, other than it's mentioned in the Dungeon Master's Guide, and just a little bit of knowledge about uh, Gamma World. And I, but those two sections in the DMG, um, Six Guns and Sorcery and uh, Mutants and Magic, always, always thrilled me because you know the idea of. Uh, like I was saying to Tracy Lesh when he was on back on Friday, I said, you know, um, you take uh, a movie like Valley of the Guanji, you know, where sure. you have the cowboys fighting the T-Rex, stuff like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the kind of genre crossover that, uh, that that I think would just go like gangbusters. Well, and I love the sharpshooting rules in, in Boot Hill so that, you know, I have a chance of shooting a guy in the head. I it, you don't have that. You don't have that in AD and D. No, no, it's it's uh, it's it's pretty abstract. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and one of the one of the funnier things we we uh, again on Friday, Tracy Lesh and I were talking about Boot Hill and AD and D crossovers, and there's a very funny book put out by Steve Jackson Games, and it it, it kind of pokes fun at holes that can show up even in the best written. RPG rules, and one of the things it notes is that um, a cannon from Boot Hill does 3 to 12 hit points of damage. All right, well, you know, that's all well and good, but the weapon damage just ports over 1 to 1 into D&D, &D, and 3 to 12 points of damage isn't enough to knock down, like, the average third level fighter that's very true <laughs> very true just like i can just imagine a couple of prospectors they've got their mountain gun and you know protecting their uh their 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 mine stake and here comes this oh, guy dressed up like king arthur and yeah they, they blast him in the chest with a with a canister round and he just he just laughs brushes it off and yeah 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 that's what happens too so Okay. Then you get fun things like, uh, you know, contra that sticks of dynamite, Gatling guns, which I think are Gatling guns are pretty potent. The dynamite is really good. Yeah, I, I know. Every time I play Cthulhu, I like to be the guy who carries the dynamite. Oh yeah, yeah. We we played a classic uh, uh, Cthulhu campaign once, and the GM made the mistake. The keeper, rather, this was the keeper made the mistake of uh, giving us access to a case of dynamite. Oh, a case! Oh my goodness! There was no problem that 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 we could not solve for the longest time with a judicious application of two or three sticks of dynamite. I mean, yeah, cult there we go. Cultists have got us cornered in in some stony chamber, and they they they've shut the door. Or are trying to pry the door open because we're cornered in there. Mm -hmm. Just 
chuck out a couple of sticks of dynamite through the crack that they've opened and there we go yes yeah. there we go of course of course the bigger the bigger monsters <laughs> would kind of laugh at the dynamite yes, no. yeah by by the time uh i can't remember the adventure exactly but but when the dark young of shub started chasing our car <laughs> and tore the roof of it off as we were barreling through the countryside yeah the whole thought of well sure we'll use dynamite <laughs> right out the door yeah really right out the door so so you know there was something i did want to ask you uh we touched on uh, we didn't touch on we talked a lot about deities and demigods and gods demigods and heroes back uh this past summer um and i know you you did those with uh uh with rob Kuntz. uh who who did what in those volumes? yeah you know I don't like talking about that because I I I don't think Rob did his share. All right. So I I never bring it up or 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 talk about it. Okay, that's fine. That's fine. That's that's absolutely okay. Um. But uh, so, leaving the past in the past for a moment. What what's what's new? What have you got going on? You talk. No, about, that's a great question. You so, talked about this AR theme park that you were working on this summer. Ooh, on giant, giant lands, yeah. yeah. No, the guy is just getting his stuff together and, and doing his first 100 sets, mm -hmm. and he's looking for investors to invest um, in a theme park in Madison, Wisconsin. Um, the idea is just brilliant. I just loved it when I heard the idea. Mm -hmm. So um, basically, you, you, you role play giant lands. You play in, a, in an apocalyptic world with a bunch of fantasy elements. So you're combining fantasy with uh, the apocalypse. And, um, and then you're supposed to go to the park as your character. And you're supposed to have adventures in the theme park. With with the character that you've been role playing for months and months and months, I just think it's a grand idea. I just, it's definitely, it's time has come. I I like that idea a lot. Now, can your character die in the park? Absolutely, absolutely, yeah. But conversely, to the to to the to the bold and fortunate, you can raise a level. Yeah, yeah. You can, I was going to say you can raise a level and yeah. any items or boons you find in the park then you can transfer back over to the pen and paper game, back right? over to the game yes exactly nice. right yeah, I, like, I, think... I, I like that a lot oh right. it's a grand idea there, there you know there's been this division and it's almost like a, you know like a provincial thing like a us versus them between the larp live action role playing and tabletop role playing uh -huh. in a lot of aspects of the hobby but this sounds like a near perfect marriage of the two well, you know, I, I always had a lot of trouble with the, the live action role playing because I worried about the little eight year olds playing against the 30 and 40 year olds. You know mm. what I mean? About, uh, you know, getting picked on because he's small and, and not as experienced. I didn't like that concept. But but I think LARPs are coming a real long way these days, and you can have a lot of fun. I, you know, you see all these Renaissance fairs mm -hmm. where uh, actually you don't see them right now. Yeah, no, not, <laughs> yeah, not, not I know. Like that. I but, guess uh, te technically you could if you wanted to have a plague village. <laughs> yeah, yeah, really. <laughs> you know? Isn't that the truth? Yeah, sad but very true. But uh, yeah, uh, you know, it's. But anyway, Giant Lands is, is coming along. He hasn't got his investors yet, but I'm I'm pretty positive that he will. Um, I'm working on a thing called uh, Doom of the Paladin. It's a, a, a C and C Troll Lord um, okay. rule set, and it's a it's a, a solo book where you're you're picking your path along a, a quest to uh, rid the, the land of evil, and you're a paladin doing it. So I'm working on that. I'm half done with that thing. Okay. And then I'm working on, um, I did another apocalyptic game called uh, 77 Lost Worlds. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we're doing, I'm doing a big gazetteer on Ward Star. It's a, it's a star named after me. Um, um, Stephen Lee, he, he's out of uh, Florida and Fireside Creations. And uh, we did... Um, we did the science fiction game, 77 Lost Worlds, and we did um, Dragon Scales, which is the fantasy version, and they both use a deck of cards instead of dice. Okay. So when you want to strike something, you have to draw a heart. And uh, so the rules are real easy, and 
what I did though, I kept slipping his name into products. I kept st- Stephen Lee appeared all over everything, and and he finally got me back and he said, Jim, I'm paying you to do Ward's Star because <laughs> I never <laughs> I never put myself in a product, but now now I have to against my will. So that's I'm working on that. That's gonna be a gazetteer. And then there was something else I'm doing. Oh yeah, I've started a novel. Um, I'm I'm working with uh, another fellow, and we're doing a, a fun, a fun novel idea that I can't talk about because it's a it's a whole new genre of writing. And I'm on chapter two, and he's on chapter one. Basically, what happens is he's writing all the odd chapters, and I'm writing all the even chapters. Excellent. And, uh, yeah, it's it's going to be a fun idea. I think I'm looking forward to getting that done this year. Good, good man. I mean, you you sound like you're a workaholic. You're not slowing down. And oh no no I I keep real busy and that's that's fantastic I mean I would say to our audience and to you I mean Jim Ward is never going to slip into the whatever happened to column <laughs> not until I croak <laughs> <laughs> well I love writing it's it's a it isn't really a job for me at all it's just a fun experience and and I have a good imagination right the Lord's still giving me my brain, which I really appreciate. Oh, I'm in yeah. a wheelchair, but I, I I can use my brain, so that's good for me. You count your blessings, man. You you uh, gotta count your blessings. Absolutely. Um yeah. I it, as as a guy who has written a few I mean like if somebody said, Look, here's the volume of RPG work that Bill Sylvie has done, we need you to do that much, like you would be done in a weekend. <laughs> um, I and I know a lot of other people who who dabble. I mean, you don't dabble. You're like the you're you're a freaking machine, dude. And I mean that as a as a serious. Well, compliment. thank you very much. That's very um, kind of you. But is there is there some advice you can give to to the ill motivated? It's not <laughs> like, like when I finished. Um, Teeth of the Barkish Noor, and then, of course, you know, circumstances happened. It didn't get published, uh, but I was able to to clean up and and release uh, sort of an edited version in um, uh, the Lost Crypt. I mean, getting stuff done is a thrill, like sitting yeah. down and looking at a completed manuscript and sending it off. And, you know, maybe I got to polish it up a little bit and send it back. And then I get it back and got to polish it some more. You know, the editor, writing editor, writing process mm-hmm, is better mm-hmm. than anybody. Um, what, how does a guy get motivated to, 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 to just, to, to sit down and do that and to knock out 5k words in, in a, in a weekend or, or in a day. Yeah, sure. Yeah. I can't, um, actually Ed Greenwood, I'm really jealous of him. He mm-hmm. can do 7,000 words in a day. I've, I've never been able to do that. Um, but I, I give writing tips on Facebook all the time. Um, the first thing you have to do is write every day. And, and even if it's just a little bit, you have to do it every single day because it, it, it helps you do more every single day. I always try to do 2,000 words every single day. And you also have to, I work from an outline all the time. Um, working from an outline makes the job much easier because you know the beginning, the middle, and the end, and you can work towards it. So I'm, I'm a real big fan of outlines, and uh, I'm a real big fan of rereading my stuff. So I do my 2,000 words in a day, and the first thing I do in the next day is reread everything I wrote the day before and look for mistakes and look for errors. I always find lots of errors. Okay. Um, and then I'm a real big fan of searching the manuscript for wills and that's. Getting rid of those two words can make your manuscript seem much more alive than if you leave them in there. So I would get rid of every single will and every single that and uh, I think you'll see that your writing improves tremendously. Okay. Well, thank you very much. And I'm definitely going to, I mean, you know, we're, we're Facebook friends. Anybody out there, though, who doesn't at least follow Trace's Facebook page for writing information, you do so now. He has, he has given us carte blanche to, uh, to, to check out his, his uh, writing tips. And I definitely think you should because this guy 
knows what he's doing. Yeah, well, I have been doing it for a long time, over 40 okay. years now. <laughs> oh, good night. So I've made lots of companies lots of money, which I'm yeah. very proud of. You know, I, I I think back to the 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 days of yore, you know, and, and I, I've said this time and again, and it still holds true that I, uh, you know, I... I, I picked up D&D &D when I, I think I was 11 years old, and I'm 51 now. Uh -huh. And if you had told 11-year-old me, yeah, you know, you're going to get to sit down with better than broadcast quality equipment that you paid maybe a couple hundred bucks for and talk to the guys who created that game that you love so much and even work with some of them, I wouldn't have believed it. I'd have been a uh, get out sure. of town. No, get I know what you mean. And I know what you mean. I I wish there was some way to excavate this, and yet in a way I, I don't because I'd be too embarrassed. But at that same time, I sent you guys at TSR a module that I wrote when I was like, you know, 10 or 11. Uh -huh. I'm going to send this to TSR, and this is going to get published, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, that's, uh, that's another piece of advice I give. Don't quit your day job. Yeah. I, um, Everybody thinks they can make a million dollars at role playing. It's it's you can make a million dollars at role playing. It's just very very difficult. Um, I I had it uh, quoted to me. Um, the easiest way to make a million dollars as a role playing <laughs> games designer is to start by investing two million dollars. Yeah, yeah, I've heard that exact <laughs> same thing. I've heard that exact same thing. Uh, Rich Lopez says hello, and Jim Ward is my Greyhawk hero. <laughs> well thank you very much rich so um but yeah it, it it's uh like you say i mean don't don't start out with the intention that you know you're gonna you know your your, your first product is gonna make a million dollars i i don't think anymore these days there's there's a million dollars to be made oh no i don't dis i disagree with you sir okay i think uh, i think there's lots of stuff that can happen out there that that could get that could go big time for just just being lucky you know what i mean i mean so so you you think about your favorite shows you think about your buffy the vampire slayer or or stargate or any of those who who just who got their role playing games later after the shows stopped and I think if they would have got them in the beginning, um, that they would have done much better, and the show would have done much better. So I think sure. there's good good money to be out there by just by just grabbing licenses or uh, starting your own license. Yeah, so I think it's it's a possibility. L licensing is kind of a it, it. This is just from a layperson's standpoint, and. I, I certainly want feedback from an industry vet like yourself. I'm sure we all do. But licensing is a funny thing because I think back to mid '80s TSR. You know, they had Indiana Jones and Marvel Comics, and those. those j just looking back on it, not not with today's perspective, but just thinking about it in general, it's like, okay, you guys made a role playing game for Indiana Jones and Marvel Comics, and now you know if disney had the interest to publish a pen and paper role playing game for marvel comics again i mean you know they could they could saturate the world with it and the company that got the chance to publish that role playing game i mean that that would be you know that it it, it would it'd be a huge deal it yeah, would be it, it would, it would be it would be an enormous deal so at tsr you know when you guys got Indiana Jones and you got uh you you got Conan Comics and and Conan and Red Sonia. Yeah. What was it was it just oh okay yeah we have these properties or what was there a sense of oh my gosh you know get the keys to the kingdom now um I know you you'll find this very interesting. Okay, so um we got the Conan license and we got the the Indiana Jones license. The Conan license was much was was better for us because Robert E. Howard was dead, so we didn't have a guy looking over our shoulder. The right. Indiana Jones license was awful for us because we had people there that had their own idea of how things should go. Uh, but those two, Conan and Indiana Jones, gigantic failures. Hmm. And I'll tell you why they were gigantic failures. Everybody wanted to play Conan or Indiana Jones. 
yeah. it was a terrible problem for us. So they they just they just didn't go very well. But Marvel Comics, totally different deal. Now, now if somebody had that license, I would make sure that the images from the movies were part of the deal. Oh, absolutely. So that you wouldn't have to do any art, which is always the expensive proposition. You could just use um, stills from the movies as your artwork. And mm -hmm. uh, and that would be that would be a dream come true and make make things way easier because when we did Marvel, we had two guys that all they did was Marvel characters mm -hmm. and and Marvel illustrations. But the Marvel people were really hard on us. They kept sending stuff back because they didn't like it for just the slightest thing. Um, Hulk doesn't part his hair that way. Well, <laughs> <laughs> who even knows the way Hulk parts his hair? <laughs> well, Tracy um, Lashda, Tra Tracy's in the audience. He probably does, but uh, yeah, maybe yes. But uh, <laughs> but it was it was a lot of work, a lot of extra work, very expensive. But it was it was worth a ton of dough. We we made millions and millions on the Marvel license for oh, sure. Yeah. And I know people that much like with AD and D, O D and D, M A, Gamma World, um, still to this day like original one E Marvel superheroes role playing game is their jam. Yep, yep, I quite agree. I quite agree. We did a smart thing there too. We we did a we did a set for eight, nine, and ten year olds. Mm -hmm. um, we, we did some marketing research and we discovered that the eight, nine and 10 year old plays role playing completely different than the 11 plus um, player. The eight, nine and 10 year old wants to be Thor or wants to be Spider-Man. But the 11 plus guy wants to be his own character with his own powers. Hmm. So we did a We did a, a yellow box set for the younger crowd, which was really good. That was probably the only thing I did wrong at TSR was I didn't do a younger set for D&D. &D. Mm. And so we didn't attract the 8, 9, and 10-year-olds like Wizards of the Coast and Magic the Gathering did. So that was a big mistake on my part. But it's, you know, hindsight, you can, you can tell these things. I wish I would have done something like a, a basic set, but I didn't do it. Well, speaking for myself, uh, I did get attracted to D&D at nine years old. I just didn't mm -hmm. start playing until I wore my parents down enough to get me uh, to, to, to get me some D&D &D rules sure. later. But um, yeah, I understand. <laughs> take heart. I at least was uh, w was somewhat interested in um, in in D&D. &D. But no, I, I get what you're saying. I, I, I absolutely understand. Um you know the the desire and that's one of the things my you know when when i get together i i've got some friends that i've gamed with since 1989 and oh nice we'll we'll kick around idea okay what what game do we want to play this month or you know for the next four or five sessions or whatever um and when we discuss doing a overplot or a meta plot specific thing like star wars or star trek or conan or lord of the rings is you know star wars for example if you're not luke skywalker han solo or chewbacca <laughs> you're just one of those guys running around in the background getting choked by darth vader yes. or shot by a rebel or shot by a stormtrooper that's uh -huh. it um and at that point you know, if you can't be the one flying down to blow up the Death Star, why not just play... Some, but you still want to play a science fiction game, why not just play another science fiction game? Yeah, sure. Um, and it's, you know, it's... I, I can see that... Uh, uh, Conan and Indiana Jones, same thing. I mean, you know, it's, it's 1936. Okay, we're playing Indiana Jones. Oh, cool, I'm gonna... You know, I, I'm going to go into the temple in Peru. Well, no, you're not Indiana Jones. You're uh, Colorado Smith, and you're in, uh, you know, you're not in Peru. You're in uh, Africa, you know. So. Can you still see me? I can't see you anymore. Uh, let me see. Am I having camera problems? I might be having uh, camera problems. I don't know, but you've disappeared off my screen. I can still see me, but I can't see you. All right. Let me take a quick look here. That's bizarre. Oh, my battery might have uh, might have croaked on my camera. Give me just half a second. I'm using my uh, my DSLR there, and you can re regale the folks with uh, 
with uh, a tail while I while I get my uh, camera reset here. Okay, okay buddy. So, so I was I, I met Gary in '74, and I started playing D and D, and I absolutely loved the game. Oh my goodness, I was really hooked the first second. Um, we've been playing for about three months, and uh, just ha I was having loads of fun, and I, and I was a big I was a big reader at the time, fantasy and science fiction. And I said, Gary, you absolutely have to have a science fiction version of this game. And Gary looked at me and says, you know, Jim, I don't really have time to write that right now. Would you be interested in giving it a try? Well, I was amazed because Gary had no idea if I could write at all. But he, he gave me the chance. And so I sat down and I put together a game that wasn't exactly D&D, &D, but it had D&D &D elements to it. And that was Metamorphosis Alpha. And, uh, and the book come out for five bucks, and uh, we sold 50,000 right away, and people really enjoyed it. And, uh, and so that, that allowed me to do the first science fiction role-playing game. And I'll always, I'll always uh, remark on Gary's name for giving me that chance, not knowing that I had any talent whatsoever. And, you know, I've worked at T I worked for TSR for like 20 years and wrote just a, a ton of product and, uh, and helped write other products. Um, and it was fun to do. It was, it was a, a great experience. The, we we kind of call it the Camelot because um, we had editors and designers and artists that were just wonderful and uh, probably the best in the industry. And for, for over a decade, TSR was, was the top company. If you wanted to work for the best, you'd come and work for TSR. And so we attracted a lot of good, good writers and designers that are still writing and designing and editing now. I mean, Zeb Cook and Jeff Grubb, they're still hard at it. And uh, Bruce Nesmith is working over at uh, Blizzard. So they, they, all, they all went out to do other things. And, uh, and it, it's been fun working with other companies. Um, if you want to work with a company, what you have to do first is look at their website figure out the products that they're doing and then you have to learn their their rule set so when i wanted to work for troll lord games i i learned cnc and uh and it was an it's an interesting rule set it's very much like ad and d but then i tossed them an idea free i think i think you'd like this idea and and steve chenault very creative fellow um said fine and now I've got a weird symbol on my screen that looks oh, that's like me. Uh, <laughs> that's me. I'm I'm still still getting the the video going. So, pl please, please uh, continue. Okay, okay. So um, so my advice to if you want to break into the business is you look at a website. You can look at Wizards of the Coast website. You can look at Troll Lords website or any of the Pathfinders website, and. Uh, and you get to know what they're doing and how they're doing it. And you toss them a free sample of what you can get done. So you do a module and you um, toss them a sample and prove that you can do their product. And you will get a good reaction from them. Go to conventions that they're going to and, uh, and talk to them, talk them up. And that's what I did with Steve Chenault. I, I introduced myself and and told him how much I liked the product. And uh, I've been doing product for him now for for many years. They're they're really creative guys, and they they do a lot of kickstarters, which is kind of fun. Um, kickstarters, uh, and I like them because they want to finish a product before they kickstart it, which I think is the best way to do it. Too many of these kickstarters get your money, and they haven't even started work on it yet. So I would always, if, if I get in on Kickstarters, I make sure that the product is done before I, before I toss them my valuable money. So it's just an idea for you guys. Kickstarters, of course, is, is the way for a private person to, uh, to go out there and get some, uh, get some revenue, get some uh, money to, uh, to produce your products. Um, the Giant Lance guy, he did that very same thing. He did a Kickstarter um, and, and got enough money to do 100 sets. And uh, the Giant Lands uh, is a game that uses percentile dice um, for, for everything. Percentile dice for the monsters, for the combat, 
Um, I, I like when I do when I do game designs. I like doing different stuff. Um, that's why I did on uh, seventy seven Lost Worlds and on Dragon Skills. That's why I did a deck of cards because I said to myself, everybody has a deck of cards, and it's kind of fun to draw cards to to make things happen. So when you wanted to do something dexterous, you had to draw a club, and when you wanted to draw when you want to be defensive, you have to draw a spade. And uh, if you want to do maximum damage, you draw a heart. And if you want to do half damage, you draw a diamond. And, and when you go through your deck, you just shuffle it up again. And uh, the higher the card that you draw, the, the better or worse the situation. So you're in, you're in the middle of a combat with, a, with um, zombies. And you, there he's back. Okay, back. good to see ya. Um, anyway, you're, you're doing a combat with zombies. And you want to do a ton of damage. So you want to draw a big heart. You want to draw a king or an ace of hearts. But if you draw yourself a two of clubs, you don't do any damage at all, and bad things happen to you. So the, the things, cards man. determine, yeah, the cards determine um, the good and bad things that happen in the game. And so it, it's got a, got a nice big following. You can, you can either look at the Facebook page for both of those games. Um, for Dragon Scales or for 77 Lost Worlds. Or you can do uh, firesidecreations.com, which is the uh, the Florida um, company site that has all the stuff for sale. And he, um, Stephen Lee, really supports his products well. There are a lot of adventures for both of those game systems. And now he's doing uh, anthology, short story anthologies so that you can read stories about your favorite game and, and get fun tips on uh, on scenarios that you can run based on the stories. We got a bunch of great, great novelists that are that are writing for him and just doing a terrific job. He just came out with um, an anthology called Concord. Concord is um, like uh, Forgotten Realms has Waterdeep. Um, um, Dragon Scales has Concord. Concord is the big fantasy city where where cool things happen. Very so, cool. Yeah, Very that's me. Cool. So, how about questions from the peanut gallery? Got anybody asking anything? Yeah, Rich Lopez says, "I want to hear how Jim came up with Yondala and her children." We're introducing the halfling pantheon for our current <laughs> campaign. <laughs> you know what? Those just come off the top of my head. They don't. They don't have any um, basis in fact. Or um, I. I just. I did uh, of gods and monsters with troll lord boys. Um, that was uh, another pantheon book, and uh, and all of the names um, from that book um, just just come out of my head. And uh, and that, that happens a lot. All the monsters from M A and the monsters for Gam World. Um, they just all pop in my head. I'm um, Yixels and Obes and and Orleans. They're just they're just completely made up. Um, I don't I don't base them on on any creatures or any ideas. I, they they just come springing forth in my brain when I need them. Well, that's one of the things that um, like I love uh, about all the stuff that you've done over the years, your work in ADD, Gary's work in ADD, everybody's, uh, you know, input on the systems like, um, you know, Paul Stormberg and I burned up some electrons going back and forth talking about, uh, the, um, a few of the names that, the, that Gary used uh, for various things in the Greyhawk setting. And, like, we found out that uh, um, oh, what was it? Sojkanth was, uh, like, had a root in Urdu or Pashto for Red Hook Mouth. Well, who's, who's the, the villainous in Lost Caverns of Sojkanth? Drelzna, who's a vampire. Yeah, uh, yeah. Red hooked mouth. You know, and, and he loved to pay, take people's names and um, do them backwards. Yeah, it says and, Dromage. And, yeah, <laughs> yeah, it says Dromage. And, and put them on his maps and put them in his games. He loved grabbing the names and putting them backwards. I thought I thought it was always kind of an odd thing. <laughs> but but that's just a, just a quirk of his that he just loved doing. 
Um, oh, a question from Chris Spiller. Jim, you're probably best known for running MA and GW games, but I was wondering uh, if there's a specific area of Earth slash Greyhawk in which you really enjoy running adventures. You know, that's an interesting question. Tell him well done. On, on Friday afternoons, I do this thing called Crimson Hawk. And what happened was um, a guy named Nick Cole, he's a really good author. That He, he and Jason Arnsbach uh, do the, the Galaxy Edge novels. And uh, and Nick said, Jim, you know, you live through, through Gary's games, and I would really like to play a Gary-style D&D game. And I said, you know, that, that's easy for me to do. And so what I did was I put together 20 levels of a Crimson Hawk Ruins based on the kind of style that Gary did. Um, in other words, in a Greyhawk, Gary had three, three different ruins. And one of the ruins was controlled by dwarves and mm -hmm. was filled with gold. And another of the ruins was controlled by elves and was filled with magic. And then there was the central core of Greyhawk ruins. And that had the big tough monsters and that had the deepest dungeons. And so what I did for Nick and his, and his um, players was I put together a very much Gary style game. Gary loved to do fountains. Um, in his dungeon. So I put I put together a whole level filled with fountains. Um, Gary liked to do themes in his dungeon. So I've got I got several different types. I've got an undead theme and I've got a clockwork mechanism theme in my dungeons. Mm -hmm. And so um, the idea was to to make the game like Gary's game. And so that's that's what we've been playing. And and so I, I you know I, I certainly never want to um, copy Gary's material, you know. I don't want to copyright infringement. The great, the great author, sure. but I can do my own style that, and like Gary did it, and uh, and so that's what we do on on Friday. So it's my homage to Gary. I, when I croak, I hope somebody takes my dungeon and and turns it into a product, so that we can have another Gary style product out there. Yeah, that's you know I. I, I agree with you 100%, uh, Jim. Well, I, I hope you don't wait until you croak. Uh, for, for, for us to <laughs> well, see we'll, we'll see. I have to find a company that's interested in doing it. Right, right. I, I, I feel you. Speaking of companies and working with companies, this I, I really wanted to ask you this back in July, and we had so much fun with other stuff that it slipped my mind, so I'm definitely going to get it in now. Um I am a big fan of and still find a lot of utility in the SSI uh, Dungeon Master's Assistance Volume 1 and 2. Sure, sure. Uh, and there's, there's a, I've seen a lot of people try open source implementations of DM assistance software for Windows and stuff. And I, I, I got it still to this day. You know, I'll, I'll open up an emulator, a DOS box type thing, so it'll run on modern systems and mm -hmm. use the Dungeon Master's Assistant all day. Uh, your name is on the credits, and it's on the credits for a couple of the actual gold box games, the Forgotten Realms uh, adventures that SSI released around the same time. What was your involvement with those? Yeah, sure. No, I, I helped with all of those, actually. Mm -hmm. Um. Um, oh, hang, I have to sneeze. Hang on just a second. <laughs> all right, I'm back. You know, your your picture isn't moving at all. Is that yeah, normal? Yeah, I, and I'm, I'm pulling a funny face, of course. Let me uh, stop. And I don't care, but anyway. Um, so I there was I was the vice president of of production in those days, okay. and um, they wanted someone important um, reviewing the material that SSI was making, and so I was I was selected as and so what I did was I would play every single game, mm -hmm. and I would I would go through every single product that they did, and give them advice and tell them you know what what my input was has has the D and D A D and D fan. So I've got credits in most of those most of those gold box games, which were just wonderful. They really were. And that's actually uh, well, I mean, it's it's a famous piece that's been on quite a few TSR products. But uh, one of the boxes is over your uh, right shoulder there. That that was the 
uh, I think that was the uh, cover of Volume 1, uh, Monsters and Encounters. Well, that was that was Pool of Radiance, of course. Oh, that was Pool of Okay, all right. Yeah, Pool of Radiance, which was the first their first product, mm -hmm. and it sold great, and uh, they they broke records for sales on that. And actually, almost all the gold box sets broke broke records every single time they came out because people just enjoyed the heck out of them. Oh yeah. And uh, so it was the fun, kind of a funny story. So I was playing through them and. The games took a lot of time to play, and they were doing two games a, a year. Um, and so, you know, I had a regular job. And so I, I complained to them, hey, I, uh, I, they, these take a long time. I need a god party. And so what they did for me was they, they made a high-level party that never lost hit points. Nice. <laughs> so yeah, I know it was great. So I could I could walk through each of the games and kick butts, and uh, and I remember playing one game where they had these uh, black bat things that came out and attacked you, mm -hmm. and th and they they shocked the heck out of me when I saw them at first, and uh, and so I wrote them a long letter about how much I enjoyed the bat things. I'm sure I don't remember the name they had for them, but. Um, um, but it just having the God party was really nice for me because then I could I could finish a, a whole game in a weekend as opposed to spending, you know, 90 to 150 hours. Yeah, I, I recently I started doing a live stream kind of let's play of Pool of Radiance, but I I'm, I'm a bad host. I, I uh, stopped doing the stream, but I did complete the game. I did finish playing Pool of Radiance and that was uh that was an adventure, man. That, that that was that was very much a uh, an an epic journey through. Um, yeah, it that, was. That, we and we did that. we did a set of novels on it, and mm -hmm. we also did a role playing product on it. Oh yeah. it was it was a it was a good deal. It was a, a very very basic, very this is the way the game is played kind of game. Mm -hmm. And I mean the the it it, it really perfectly captured the AD and D feel. Yeah, uh, I think so too. I, I mean, you know, there, there, there's no question that they get it right. I mean, even to the point that, like, when you would have encounters, the sprites on the screen for the monsters mm -hmm. were taken from the AD and D artwork. That's yeah. Dave Trampier's Cobol. That's <laughs> Dave Sutherland's uh, uh, Troll. You know, it just sure, sure. I, I and as a kid, I was like. <gasps> Oh my God! How'd they do that? That's amazing, you know. Yeah, really. That um, was that was Chuck Krogel and Victor Penman. They were just they were just excellent people. They knew the game backwards and forwards, which I really appreciate. Um, but every once in a while, I'd get a call from Chuck, um, and hmm. Chuck was the, the the head of the the company in those days, and he would say, "Jim, can we can we do the rules this way?" And naturally, it, it, if people would have seen what they were doing, they would have said, "No, you can't do that." You know, they they wanted they wanted to be able to go to a campsite and heal up all the damage instead of healing one point a day. Right. So they'd come with those kind of questions for me, and he and I would then uh, do a little trading. Okay, yes, you can do that, but then you have to do this. <laughs> you know. So it was right. it was a, just a fun experience of uh, of working with those guys. Um, they they came from the programming end, and mm -hmm. I came from the playing end. And and what we what we finally wound up with was was a fun experience in the middle, so it it really turned out well. Yeah, it, it is. And and for our, for folks watching the stream right now, uh, first of all, I apologize for my video freezing. It's a problem with the camera. I don't want to get up and reboot it right now, so you'll just have to put up with a still image of me. Um, uh, if it freezes again. Hey, it's a handsome image. It's okay. Well, thank you, Jim. Thank you yeah. very much. Um, there we go. But uh, the other thing I did want to mention to folks is if you uh, if if you haven't played the 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 gold box games, they're like a dollar ninety nine a piece on good old games, and they come in self installing just all in one executables. You don't have to jump through a bunch of hoops. You don't have to like change settings or or create a virtual DOS machine to run them on. Uh, go after this uh, great live stream that we have going here. 
go and and uh, purchase them from good old games they uh, they will run just fine on a modern Windows 10 computer oh that's and great I, will, I didn't know that that's you fun you will have an absolute blast and yes you can take your party all the way from Pool of Radiance through to the end of Curse of the Azure Bonds so, uh, well, are you, can you do the Beholder one too? Have they got that one out? I the Beholder, yeah, I think I the Beholder is there. I I bought them all. They had like some insane sale before Christmas a couple of years ago, uh -huh. and my father-in-law it was a huge computer role-playing game fan. So I was just like, yeah, one for me, one for him. And oh so wow, I, that's fun. I played through, you know, I, I did a playthrough of Pool of Radiance. Like I said, I started live streaming it, and it was a lot of fun. Um, nice. But uh, yes, yes, yes. Do go well, get the those. nice part. The nice part too of the Gold Box games, they're still today very playable. And, oh, you know, absolutely. as opposed to like the first couple Ultimas, or you know, they're kind of they're kind of clunky and not not definitely as playable as the Gold Box games. Yeah. I I picked up. Um, I'd say it's probably been 10 or 15 years now, but um, the company that, owned, that that bought Sir Tech Software, they did the Wizardry series, uh -huh. um, they released like an Ultimate Wizardry collection, all the games on one CD-ROM, all of the instruction books in this nice, thick, chunky manual. And I was like, yes, I'm going to do this. I'm going to play through, because I, I never finished it on my Commodore back in the day and mm. I was like, i'm gonna play through all the and man half the time you're not fighting monsters you're fighting the user interface no that's never good or the lack thereof you know it just... yeah and back when i was 11 years old 10 years old 12 years old it was okay to do that because what else was i gonna do you know uh -huh. <laughs> i hear you buddy it was, the, yeah. it was the only game in town but it's like do i want to do this or do i want to go play skyrim well <laughs> you know so um yeah the 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 ui and everything for uh the gold box games has held up a lot better than than wizardry I'm yeah sure. i agree i agree um oh we have another question uh another from rich lopez can jim tell us about how he selected the authors and artists for the various pantheons and deities and demigods i don't know if that goes back to what we didn't want to discuss before Jim and it's well fine. okay so i was the author on the pantheons okay so that's the easy part um we had an art director in those days mm -hmm. and he he selected the various artists for for those you know and I, I didn't know until like a couple of years ago that a bunch of people used them as coloring books yeah i didn't know people did that to do these at demi guides i found it very interesting i i have uh one that a friend gave me um and i had seen one other one i i've had uh, you and i and have had the discussion about uh the alleged rarity of deities and demigods oh yeah sure um and i've or not it, yeah. or the, not uh you uh i've discussed it on stream uh with, with uh, folks before um over the years just finding them in used bookstores uh, buying them on eBay before the craze went. I've had 13 copies of Deities and Demigods. Have you really? The, 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 yeah, and I've given them away or, you know, sold them for a little bit of money. You know, I, uh -huh. I never got rich and I never wanted to on uh, those things. But um, I, of of those, two of them have had colored pages. And I, and I have one of those because a, a friend of mine gave it to me and he wrote a very, very nice epic poem in the in the front fly leaf now oh fun you know um and so my deities and demigods is is colored in um yeah i still get letters from eight nine and ten year olds who tell me that they used it they used the book in their in their classes for uh for you know pantheon they use it as a resource i, sure. I just love that love that yeah. to death because i did a ton of research and that was before that was before google i had to go to libraries and do the research for all of those pantheons and i worked very hard at giving them whatever uh whatever weapon they had historically mm -hmm. um you know or whatever mount um so i i did a ton of research and i i think it paid off people still love the book oh yeah it's a, it's an amazing book and um 
you know, it's it's a shame about all the nonsense about the removed pantheons, but what are you going to do? What um, are you going to do? Now, now that that brings up something also, and if um, for some of our younger, well, I guess listeners to me and watchers of Jim right now, um, you might not be aware of the moral panics that popped up around D and D, and TSR began to have to kind of tiptoe around a lot of things uh there there are a couple of pantheons and deities and demigods that represent current ongoing real world beliefs uh hindu beliefs shinto beliefs um did you did you feel any trepidation about that uh, about taking you know the the real world beliefs of an active religion and putting them into into game stats at all you know that's a great question well done and the answer is i was a stupid dude i was naive and so that thought never occurred to me as i was putting together these things the only the only um group that i heard a lot of grief from were the hindus Mm. who, who just did not like me putting game stats to their their um, gods that they worship, you know, in real life. Sure. Um, but you know, the the Indians could have had a quarrel, but they didn't ever gave me any grief. Or the the Chinese or the Japanese. Um, but yeah, I just was ignorant about that kind of thing. I was I was 25 when I wrote that book, and the thought never occurred to me. It was it was kind of like uh, when I did Metamorphosis Alpha. I put in defects that you had to work with, mm-hmm. and one of the defects I put in was epilepsy. Or epilepsy, and mm-hmm. I didn't mean anything about it. I just, I just put it in there as something that you had to get work with, you know, to survive. And I got a great big letter from the Epilepsy Foundation saying they didn't appreciate epilepsy um, being what they called made fun of in a game, which we never did, but they they considered it that way because sure. I put it in the game and gave it game stats, and uh, and so it was just me being naive, me being not knowing that people would object to that. So, mm. you know, when, when I get that kind of stuff, I, I back off. I, I don't want people irritated at, at products that are being written, um, uh, except for demons and devils. Yeah. Those boys, those people on the far whatevers mm-hmm. um, did not like demons and devils in our book. And they, they never read the hardbound books, never, ever when they complained about the demons and devils in the game and the fact that you could summon them. Oh my goodness. So um, what I'm very proud of what I did, I renamed them in second edition. We did Batazoo and Tanari mm-hmm. instead of demons and devils. And so when the, the various retailers asked us and when we got asked at, at conventions, we always said, oh, we've taken the names of demons and devils out of our game. And they shook their heads and said, well, that's good. I'm glad to hear that you did the responsible thing. Well, they never read it to see that all we did was change the names. So it was just kind of an ignorant thing for people to get upset about that that we fixed and we kind of tricked them. But it was their fault for not really looking at our stuff. Right, right. So that, yeah, that, that that's... Uh... That, that that's an interesting tale to to the the renaming uh, of the uh, the demons and the devils and I think you know I I, I I think and I've been guilty of this okay I'm not I, I I'm not uh, going to hide that but I I think there's a lot of you know grr, hardcore AD and Ders uh, you know we came up with one E and one E was was the best way that maybe threw a, more than a little bit of shade about the renamings of those things. But with that said, it's, you know, do we want to make millions of dollars through retail sales or do we want to make hundreds of thousands of dollars through specialty and capital yeah, sales sure. only? You know, I have to tell you too, it's, 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 Gary did a subtle thing that, that hardly anybody really recognizes. Gary wanted good to always conquer evil. All right? Mm -hmm. So those demons and devils were made as challenges to the heroes to conquer. Yeah. 
And so I, I approve of that very much. Um, these days now, our, our boys at Wizards of the Coast have kind of gone wild and decided that drow and orcs shouldn't be evil. Well, that's yeah. not what Gary wanted. Gary wanted um, foes that you automatically knew were bad. So when you see an orc or you see a drow, you know that you've got to fight those guys. You know that you have to, you're in for a fight of your life. Um, yeah. And it's the same thing with demons and devils. There are challenges to, for good to conquer evil, which I think is a very noble concept. I mean, it's very subtle in D&D &D and AD&D. &D. You, you, you don't see it. You, it's hard to recognize. But that's Gary did that on purpose. Yeah. And uh, just the idea of, of, you know, you can be heroic. I just think it's, it's uh, healthy. I really do. No, I, 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 I think you uh, are. I, 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 I agree with you, and I, I, I think you'll find that that the audience here is 100% behind that. Now, I mean, with that said, I think throwing the players a curve and finding the one, you know, the, the, the one diamond in the rough, you know, the one orc that doesn't want to be a murderous, butchering uh, bad guy can really kind of, you know, it, it can kind of make the players... You know, it mixes things up. It plays with their expectations a little bit. <laughs> okay, you know, it's kind of funny you mention that. Okay, so we have Drist Duwarden. Right. And and he is actually a, a lawful drow. Mm -hmm. And I, I always remember Gary's comments about Drist Duwarden. And, and people said, well, what about Drist Duwarden? And Gary would say, well, you know, that's a drow who is obviously totally insane. <laughs> exactly Which so. I, f I found very funny. Just just hilarious. The um the the you can bump into ba I always thought this was was kind of funny, but you can bump into gangs of bandits in D2 and D3 that are comprised of drow outcasts mm -hmm, who see mm -hmm. no good in their society, but the the goodest quote unquote of them are chaotic good. Yeah. You know, most of them are chaotic, neutral, or neutral evil. That, uh, but like you say, I mean, you know, the, these these could be from a drow perspective are all crazy people. They're crazy people. What yeah. do you mean you don't want to do drugs and torture prisoners? What what's wrong with you? Didn't I raise you right? <laughs> yeah, really. I mean, Bob Salvatore, just a brilliant writer, just does a very good job even today mm -hmm. writing in that genre. And uh, and I, I really liked his Drift character. I thought it was excellent. Um, but again, you know, totally insane. <laughs> yeah I, I like that characterization yeah and, and with it with that said with that said gary's the guy that made him playable in in unearthed arcana I mean, mm -hmm. so uh what while while we have uh we have uh bob salvatore to perhaps uh I want to be careful with this word blame for uh for drizzed gary gave them player character stats and said yeah you can play a drow elf in uh in in unearth arcana so well yeah he had he had no problem with playing a band of evil characters because yeah, they had a tough life they got they got attacked from all directions yeah. so he you know that was kind of a learning lesson for those kind of guys i want to play an evil character well sure that's no problem but then from the, from the day they start <laughs> you know they're they're being attacked by everybody yeah i you know my my take on evil characters is uh, look first of all if if somebody says hey you know i got the stats can i be a paladin yeah absolutely and the person who says you know i want to be evil well we've got a paladin in the party dude you know, uh, it's like he rolled up the stats. Chance blessed him. You're making a choice. So maybe rethink that alignment decision for your character. And the other thing is I have never encountered, and maybe this is different for you or anyone else out there, but I have never encountered a person who really 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 wanted to play an evil character that wasn't just looking to get their charlie manson on at the table and yeah, no i've 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 played with lots of guys who, who like being evil characters yeah just tons really that's one of the reasons why i took out assassins in second edition mm. it's it's because you know 
you, you can't role play the assassin very well. You're rolling percentile dice to see if you succeed. That's not really role playing. You know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. So that's yeah. why we removed it. It was it was a, a character that just wasn't real healthy for role playing. And as much grief I think as again the hardcore set might give you for the removal of assassins. If you go back, th there are scanty few indications of what Gary had planned for a second edition of AD&D himself. But, and this may shock some of the people listening who've never seen this, and I wish I had, like, a link to to the quotes. Removal of the Assassin was on the menu. Yep. You know? It, yeah, it was. It, it, it was. So, you know, anybody who wants to throw shade at Jim, once again... <laughs> Gary was was absolutely all for uh, <laughs> cutting the assassin's throat, if you will. There we go. So, there we go. Oh my goodness! So, um, let me ask you this personal question, Bill, Bill to Jim. You gonna jump into one of my games at GaryCon? <laughs> Probably not, buddy. I. Uh, and, and not because I don't want to. It's just because, you know, a Friday, Saturday, and Sunday game wears me out. What happens is I, I, I referee the game, and then I go to bed. <laughs> oh, I just You're a teenager. I, I know yeah, it. <laughs> yeah, no, no, no. They, they take a lot of effort for me. I, they, uh, uh, they just, they, they, it's, it's an emotional roller coaster. And, sure. and you know, I have to deal with people who, who question what how I play, which uh, you know I go with Gary and say you know, but the DM right or wrong the DM, yeah. and so a lot of people don't understand that at all. We're we're in a culture right now thanks to the Pathfinder and Wizard boys, mm. where where everybody's <laughs> amazed that they you know they they amazed that they die, <laughs> you know <laughs> their their character isn't supposed to die. Well, I got news for you, buddy. Yeah. I died in the first game I played with Gary. I died in the first 15 minutes. Well, conventions aside, one of these days I will virtual or reality, I will drag you into one of my games. I would love there to have we go. you at the table. I would, okay, well, when we get seriously. to when we get to a real Gary con, I'll be happy to play a game. Awesome. I I will I will absolutely hold you to that. And yeah, no problem. And uh, the hour is is getting uh, is getting a little long in the tooth, um, so I, I think I'll let you off the hook for now. Uh, you're going to come back though, right? If you want me to, I don't think that's a question. So I don't want to be I don't want to be boring for your for your listeners. Oh yeah, because I think everybody was real bored with your TSR history. See, and, and there the we go. Right. Yeah, I can. That understand. is not true. You hush, Jim Ward. <laughs> I, I, you are going. You are going to be back. We'll, we'll have. I tell you what. We'll do like maybe kind of a an after Gary Con after action, and we can compare notes. Okay, we can do that. For, that for, sounds for, great. Good for idea. These, for 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 these fine folks in our audience who had great questions. Thank you, Rich. Thank you, Chris. Thank you for the folks who who sat in and listened and put up with camera silliness on my part. Um, and remember, if, if you're just getting here or just got here a little bit ago, my streams do stay up so you can listen in live or li uh, listen in, you know, uh, the stream right off Facebook. So don't, don't fear that you, you lost anything. So I want to extend my uh, utmost gratitude to you, Jim, once again, for appearing on the show. Uh, I hope we virtually bump uh, into each other at uh, GaryCon this year, and we will definitely meet face-to-face -face soon. Okay, buddy. All right, Jim. You, you take care of yourself, and we'll see you around. All right. Very good. Bye-bye. Peace. <laughs>